the Anglo-Boer War, as witnessed by Denis Reitz, and written in his book Commando, a Boer War Journal of the Boer War, by Denis Reitz. Chapter 24. Calmer Waters From now onward, the circumstances of our expedition into the Cape radically altered for the better. Here in the far west, there were no railways, and the country was so difficult for large bodies of troops that we had reached comparative sanctuary. North, stretching towards the Orange River, hundreds of miles away, lay a great territory practically free of the enemy, save for rare columns passing by, and a few garrisons scattered long distances apart, so that we had the country almost to ourselves. Small bands of local rebels had long been carrying on desultory warfare, warfare of their own between Yar and the coast, and General Smuts told us that he was going to reorganize these into larger commandos until he was strong enough to undertake big-scale operations, which he thought might ease the pressure in the two republics. Thus, we looked forward with fresh interest to the new stage of the war opening before us. That same evening, we moved off, still going west our wounded now comfortably driven in carts, while those of us who had returned without horses were provided with temporary mounts. <laughs> a welcome change after our long tramp. In a few days' time, we reached Irland's Flay, an oasis of waving palms and running water, and yet we halted for two whole days. This was the first time since crossing the Orange River into the Cape that we had stayed in one place for even a day and a night. And needless to say, both man and beast reveled in the unaccustomed holiday. In the hills nearby ran a troop of mules, and some friends and I managed to catch half a dozen of, the, of them, mine being a, a powerful black who squealed and bit and threw me several times before I mastered him. And then he was quite gentle, and I rode him for many hundreds of miles during the next few months. From Ilan's Flay, we went northwest via Bedeau to a place called Kobi, a deep valley that reminded me of Dreadful Hollow in Robbery Under Arms. And here again, we lay over for several days, feeding our animals on the plentiful crops. Thence we crossed the intervening mountains to the great plain that runs towards the Atlantic, 60 miles away. At the foot of these mountains lies the village of Van Reinsdorp. It had been recently garrisoned by the British, but Commandant Maritz had swooped down and captured it. This Maritz was a policeman from Johannesburg, who, after many adventures, had established himself in these parts as a leader of various rebel bands. He was a short, dark man, of enormous physical strength, cruel and ruthless in his methods, but a splendid guerrilla leader, and according to his lights, an ardent patriot, of whom I was to see more later on. He had sacked the village and disappeared with his retainers, and we found the original civil population in peaceful occupation. The English having apparently abandoned the place for good. As the rake section was now practically defunct, General Smuts ordered William Con Conradi and me to join his staff. This was in recognition of our late exploit, and was tantamount to military promotion. The rest of the Reich section was absorbed into Commandant Bauer's commando, with the exception of Ben Kutsia, who rode away 
his legs still in splints, in search of Maritz, for they were old friends. This then was the end of that small company with whom I had come into the Cape, like Isaac Malherbe's corporalship and the ACC, it too had been destroyed. But I am glad to have served with, with three such bodies of men. I was now what might correspond to a staff officer in a regular army, although none of us on General Smuts's headquarters bore any distinguishing title, beyond the fact that the rest of the men in the friendly derision referred to us as Kripfreter, a Kripfreter being a stall-fed horse, as distinguished from one having to scratch for its own living in the felt. On assuming my new duties, however, I soon found that, so far from being stall-fed, the members of the staff, in addition to having to fight and forage for themselves, like the rest, were employed as dispatch riders. And during the next few weeks of our life was one continual round of weary rides in search of one portion or another of the commando. For General Smuts had now divided his force into smaller groups, often stationed days apart, to provide more easily for grazing and food. In December of 1901, he left the commando scattered along the banks of the Olifants River, near Van Rensdorp, and with his staff moved up the mountains to a spot called Willems River where he began his work of collecting the various rebel bands into uh, organized commandos. A large number of men from this area had either joined Maritz or were riding about on their own, sniping at British columns or waylaying convoys, and in order to get in, in touch with these irregulars, we Kripfreter were sent during the next few weeks on long rides, in the course of which we travelled unnumbered miles from south of the Willifans River to far beyond Kalfinia and back, until we knew every inch of the country. The inhabitants sympathised with us and looked upon us as their champions, so we were welcomed wherever we went. And Despite long, grueling journeys on muleback, I enjoyed myself, for I was not above feeling a pleasant glow when the women folk waved from before the farmhouses, and the men shouted greetings from the roadside. On Christmas Day, returning from a hundred-mile errand beyond Calfinia, I saw mounted men camped in, a, in the distance and making thither, found them to be Commandant van Deventer's missing column. My unexpected appearance among them was hailed with joy, for this was their first word of us since we had parted below the uh, Sierbergen. And for a long time I was busy telling them how we had fared and listened to their experiences. They had only just arrived here, having been driven, uh, driven out of their course for several weeks, but they had done well, for they had captured several convoys and many prisoners, and they had more horses and rifles and ammunition than they could use. After a pleasant evening's talk around the campfires, I remained there for the night, and took the road again the next day, getting back by the 28th to General Smuts, who was greatly pleased at my news. My mule had unflinchingly trotted the better part of 200 miles in five days, and the following morning I was off again in search of Maritz, whom I found 80 miles away in the neighborhood of Tondelbos. This place was an important grain growing center at which the British had posted a force of men to prevent the crops from being carried away. Maritz attacked the garrison the day before I arrived, 
but was repulsed with heavy loss, he himself being severely wounded. I found him seated on a chair in a farmhouse with two of his men dressing his wound, a terrible gash below the right armpit, exposing the lung, an injury that would have killed most men, but he was like a bull and seemed little the worse for it. I saw the year 1902 in with them, and then started back, catching up with General Smuts three days later at Nivotsville on the escarpment. During all this time, our main commando and uh, Commandant Bauer was lying down in the plains to the south, having an occasional uh, brushes with the English, but on the whole passing a quiet time. Some of our pat patrols went beyond Portoville, to within sight of Table Mountain, and my old companion Kriche, uh, the general's brother-in-law, with whom I had served in Isaac Malherbe's corporalship, and who had been so badly wounded at Spionkop, even penetrated as far as Malmesbury, and brought back a large sum of money for the use of the commando from General Smuts's father, who lived there. During a visit which I paid at uh, this time to our men along the Willifans River, I met my old ladysmith tentmate, Walter de Vos, who had likewise been wounded in, on Spionkop, and whom I had last seen lying on the slope of that hill. On the day of the big fight two years before, he had latterly been in command of one of the local rebel bands, and we spent the morning talking over old times. But he was killed an hour after my going in an outpost affair nearby. Early in January, General Smuts decided to go north to the Orange River to organize the numerous rebel patrols that were under arms there. Our company consisted of himself and his staff only. It was a 300-mile ride through desert country, and we went first of all to Tontelbos, now evacuated, as the crops were in. Maritz was here on a pallet of straw in an empty dwell dwelling house, but he made light of his wind and was well on the mend. From Tontelbos, we moved north through the country, thinly occupied by nomad boers, or, or track boers as we called them, who spend their lives going from one well to another with their flocks, like the old peoples in the Bible. They are a primitive, patriarchal folk, knowing little of the outside world, but of a brave and uh, sturdy stock, and many of them were under arms. We travelled mostly at night to avoid the blazing heat of the day, and at length reached Karkamas, a small irrigation colony found by the Dutch church on the south bank of the Orange River. The settlement was still in its infancy, and the inhabitants lived in crude huts and shelters made of grass and reeds, but they had built a canal from the river and had established fields and orchards so successfully that the place had become a supply depot for the surrounding dis districts. We spent a pleasant fortnight here, uh, eating fruit and swimming in the river every day. As soon as General Smuts had uh, completed his arrangements with the guerrilla bands, many of whom rode in from the desert to meet him, we returned south reaching Tontelbos again towards the second week in February. Maritz was no longer here, but as the grazing was good in the, the cropped wheat lands, we lay over a few days to rest our animals and ourselves. General Smuts then decided to go eastwards in search of Commandant van Deventer. We did not know exactly where his commander was, but we travelled up along the Fish River, and after a day or two got word 
that he was 30 or 40 miles away. We rode the, the, all that night, and towards daylight heard the sound of gunfire and small arms, and saw a red glare in the sky. Quickening our pace, we reached a farmhouse called Middle Post at dawn, and found two or three men here in charge of a dozen wounded. They told us that Van Deventer was fighting close by with an English column on its way to Calfinia. So after a few hurried questions, we rode to where we could see his men, lining a crest of some small copies, their horses tethered below. On higher ground, away to the left, were small parties of English troops and a single field piece. It stood in full view, but out of rifle range. The men at the farmhouse warned us to ride for it, as they said that the gunners had uh, distance to a yard, and we set off at a gallop. They were right, for when we had got about halfway, there was a flash at the gun, and a shell came tearing at us. A local schoolmaster named Hugo, who had joined a few weeks before, was riding beside me. The shell burst on us with a roar, but although I was nearer the gun, neither my mule nor I received a scratch. But when the smoke cleared, I saw that my companion was badly hit. He was swaying in his saddle with blood streaming from his chest. His rifle dropped to the ground and he fell forward on the neck of his animal. Then he recovered himself and said that he was not going to give the gunners the satisfaction of knowing that they had hit anyone. So raising himself, he rode for cover of the hill. Other shells came after, but no one else was hit, and having retrieved the fallen rifle, I rode on and found that Hugo had fainted and fallen from his horse, and that General Smuts and the others were trying to staunch his wound. It was at the base of his left lung, and I fished out the twisted buckle of his braces, and a cartridge clip with five rounds of ammunition, all of which had been driven into the cavity, in addition to the shell fragment which I could not recover. I thought that he had not ten minutes to live, but two months later he was in the saddle once more. We made him comfortable and climbed up to where Commandant van Deventer and his men were holding the ridge above. This was the first time that General Smuts had come among them since the parting in Somerset East, and there were cheers and shouts of greeting when they saw him. Van Deventer himself hastened forward to welcome us, and in a few seconds we were in the firing line. Looking down the forward side of the hill, we saw an interesting sight. Immediately below, on the level ground by the banks of a sprite, stood some 120 English conv convoy wagons, most of them burning fiercely to the crackle of exploding rifle ammunition, for every wagon seemed to carry several cases. Scattered among the blazing vehicles lay dead men and horses, and there were a large number of live troop horses and mules that had stampeded during the night, but had drifted back into the burning camp, where, in spite of the smoke and flames, and the bursting cartridges, they were feeding on the seed oats and other fodder that our men had flung from the wagons during their hasty search for loot. Before setting the wagons on fire, Van Deventer gave us a brief account of what had happened. A long convoy had approached the evening before, accompanied by a mounted column. He had disputed their way, whereupon the English troops parked their wagons beside the sprite 
and took up covering positions. But during the night, he and his men broke through the line on foot and uh, entering the camp, set it on fire. In the dark, the troops were unable to effectively hinder the work of destruction and the position when we arrived was that van Deventer, having fired the wagons, had withdrawn before daybreak. And the two sides were now facing each other with the convoy burning between them, neither side permitting the other to approach it. The bulk of the English soldiers had taken post at a farmhouse, surrounded by a walled garden about 900 yards away from which they were maintaining a hot rifle fire. And to the left, 400 yards off, lay more of them on a, a stony hill, with their field gun on a rise behind. And on the right, in another copy, was an isolated detachment, so placed that they had anyone under short range who tried to enter the camp. Van Deventer told General Smuts that he was anxious to recover the animals feeding among the wagons, to which end he had a few minutes previously sent field cornet van der Berg and about 25 men to clear the kopje, overlooking the camp by a surprise attack from the rear. He had ordered them to ride round behind some other kopjes that had screened the view. I had now ridden my mule for upwards of a thousand miles. He was a willing animal, but with his shambling gait and the long stride a mule at best makes a tiring mount, and I yearned for the easier seat of a horse. Another man on the staff, Martin Brunk, had also been on a mule for months past and was equally anxious for a change. So we decided to overtake the attacking party in the hope of getting a, a troop horse or two. We ran down and mounting, followed the tracks made by Van, Van der Berg's men as fast as we could go. He had led them with skill, for nowhere was their route visible from the copy, and when after a breathless gallop we raced round a corner of a ridge into the open, we found that he had taken the soldiers by surprise and that he and his men had reached the foot and were climbing up under a ragged rifle fire without having sustained any visible loss. By the time we joined them, the affair was as good as over. A shot or two was loosed, but in a few seconds the last of the soldiers stood up to surrender. It had, however, been an expensive little fight. Alwyn Weber, an ex Transvaal artillery officer, and two more men lay dead, and Field Cornet van der Berg and another were badly wounded, while several soldiers were killed and three or four wounded out of the dozen or so who had been holding the post. In any case, now that the copy was in our hands, it was possible to make our way down to the Spreit, on the opposite bank of which stood the burning wagons. So, leaving their friends to attend to the wounded, the rest of us lost no time in descending the slope and jumping into the Spreit. We ran along the sandy bottom until we could peer over the, at the camp, a stone's throw away. Then we climbed out and rushed for the horses that were nosing the fodder-strewn ground. When the troops from the distant farmhouse saw us running amongst the wagons, they opened fire. But we were not to be denied. My first effort was to ensure myself against further mule riding, and in three successive raids I brought away three good horses with saddles and holsters complete. I hurried each into the shelter of the Sprite and ran out again for the next. The other men were just as busy, and luckily no one was hit. As soon as I had secured my horses, I went back for other portable property. For several of the wagons 
and their loads were only half burnt, while some were scarcely damaged at all. And there was much useful loot still to be had. In dodging among the smoldering wagons, I came on a fully laden scotch cart that had been overlooked in the dark. It was quite intact, and as the firing from the farmhouse was increasing, I seized a large portmanteau and shoveled into it all that I could find in the way of books, papers, boots, and clothing, including some Bank of England notes, and then dragged it over the ground to the Sprite. I found that most of it belonged to Colonel Doran, who had commanded the convoy, and that amongst these papers were the records of the court-martial of Commandant Skeper, at which he had presided. We had heard already that uh, this well-known guerrilla leader had been captured and executed in the Midlands some months before for alleged train wrecking. After a hurried inspection of my new property, I distributed my haul evenly on my three horses and my mule and rode back to General Smuts, very pleased with the morning's work. For no longer a ragged muleteer, I was now better horsed, shod and equipped than at any time of the war. Soon after this, the English troops sent off their gun and began to retire southward, abandoning a large number of horses and mules that had broken away and were ro roaming about the felt. General Smuts and Commandant van Deventer decided not to pursue the retreating column, for even if we captured them, we should only have let them go again anyway. And we had done so well in horse flesh that it did not seem worthwhile to go after them. We were now free to revisit the camp unmolested, and in addition to hundreds of animals, the men recovered a considerable quantity of ammunition, saddlery, etc. And most valuable of all, many cases of horseshoes and nails. Five or six soldiers lay dead in the camp, and when some of us rode up to the farmhouse where their main body had been, we found twenty or thirty wounded who had been left there in charge of a military doctor. Several of them were very badly injured. At the request of a medical officer, I rode round to shoot the wounded horses and mules standing about the house some with broken legs, others with blood dripping from, from their flanks. For, with no one to look after them, it was best to put them out of their misery. One of the horses I had taken from the camp was a beautiful little dark grey Arab mare with a coat like velvet and nimble as a goat. I was mounted on her when I rode to the farmhouse, and here her former owner, a wounded officer named Chapman, lying on a stretcher outside, recognized her, and offered to buy her back from me for sixty-five pounds. He said her name was Jenny, and that she was the best horse in the country. As money was of no use to me, and I knew a good horse when I saw one, I refused to sell but I promised to look after her and treat her well. The commando spent the night at the other little farmhouse where we had first found Van Deventer's wounded, and here we buried our dead at sunrise the next day. The bodies had been placed ready on a wagon, and not knowing this, I spent the night under it, and waking in the morning, I found myself cluttered with blood and that had oozed through the planking overhead. At the funeral, General Smuts made a moving speech. He pointed out that among the dead were a Transvaaler, a Free Stater, and a Colonial, all parts of South Africa being thus represented in the common sacrifice for liberty. When the ceremony was over, 
I was ordered to ride to the place 20 miles away to which our wounded had been taken to see that all was well. I found most of the men fairly comfortable, although there were several bad cases. One was a colonial who had been shot through the stomach, and the woman of the house asked me to have a look at him as his side was inflamed. While she and I were examining the wound, he gave a deep groan and died without speaking. A wagon driver helped me to bury him. We dug a hole beside the threshing floor, and as we knew no funeral service, we simply carried him by the shoulders and knees, laid him in the grave, and covered him with earth, and left him. While I was at this farm, we saw 40 or 50 strange horsemen approaching from the north, and there was some alarm at first among the wounded as we could not make out who they were. I fetched my horse and rifle and rode in their direction until I was close enough to see that they were not British. They proved to be the survivors of a portion of the commando that General Smuts had left behind on his way through the Free State the year before. Because their horses were too worn out to go on. He had placed Field Cornet Dreyer in charge, with orders to follow later, when the condition of their animals permitted. And the faithful band had carried out these instructions to the letter. As soon as possible, they started south in their tracks, and after many trials and dangers, this remnant had come through. Among them, was the Reverend Mr. Krill, with whom my brothers and I had quarrelled at uh, warm baths in December 1900. In spite of his religious bigotry, he was a stout-hearted old man, whom I learned to respect. When they heard that General Smuts was in the district, they were so anxious to see him that they wanted to go off at once. But I told them to wait as I knew the general, the general was coming our way, and he arrived that evening with Van Deventer and his commander, and there was great rejoicing on both sides. Ever since General Smuts had gone to Karkamas in December, Commandant Bauer, with his commando, had remained down on the plains near the Ulifans River, beyond Van Reinsdorp and I was now sent to find them. I gave away my mule, but took all three of my newly acquired horses, loaded with my loot from the camp. I reached Van Reinsdorp in three days, going via Nivotsville, and thence down the mountain pass to the country below. I found Bauer in Van Reinsdorp, and most of his men camped along the True True River, not far off. They were the more pleased when I told them of Van Deventer's success, because they had suffered an unpleasant reverse the previous morning. A week before, a colonial named Lemuel Colain had turned up amongst them with a tale that the English had put him in prison at Clan William on a false charge of high treason. He said that he had escaped over the wall one night and had come in revenge to take up arms. Believing his story, they gave him a rifle and he joined the commando. Kalein, however, was a spy in British pay and after collecting what information he could, he disappeared. No particular notice was taken of his absence as the men were constantly riding off to visit farms or look up friends at distant outposts, and it was thought that uh, he had done the same. But the commander had a rude awakening when a body of English horse with Colain riding at their head fell upon them at dawn. 
killing and wounding 17 men, including my young friend Michael Duprea. The attacking force took our men so completely by surprise that the troopers rode through the camp using their swords and got away safely on the other side before our men could recover their wits. All were fierce in their denunciation of Colain's treachery and hoped that he would fall into their hands. And later, Nemesis ran the right man to earth for once. Meanwhile, Bower was smarting under this setback, for not only had he lost good men, but the British were following up their success by an advance in force, with the object of retaking Van Rensdorp, which we had come to regard as our headquarters, for it was the only town in South Africa still in Boer hands. I remained with Bower overnight in the threatened village, and as his scouts reported the next morning that a strong column of English horsemen was pushing forward, he decided to ret retire northwards to the mountains until re reinforcements could reach him. I went out to watch the enemy movements with a party, among them being my old friend Nicholas Swart and Edgar Dunker. The former, with his arm still in a sling, while the latter had his shattered hand in splints and a pillow strapped to his saddle to ease his wounded thigh, for the sound of rifle fire was an irresistible attraction to these two, and they refused to remain behind when they heard shots beyond the town. After going forward for a mile or two, we saw a long column of horsemen coming up from the direction of the Ulifants River, their scouts thrown forward on a wide front, and we were soon engaged in a running fight, which continued until they pressed us back through the streets into the open country, where we took to our heels to catch up with Boa's main body, making for the mountains. In the course of one of these skirmishes, Dunker, riding beside me, was shot through the chest. We plugged the bullet holes with pieces of his shirt and he rode on with us for 15 odd miles that we had to go before we overtook the commando. He was then sent to a farm among the foothills and uh, completely recovered in a few weeks. The English contented themselves with reoccupying our little capital and came no further. So, Bower did not retire up the mountains as far after all, but determined to recover his lost ground, he sent me hurrying up the pass to ask General Smuts for help. After riding hard for two days, I came up with him near Calfinia, 60 miles off, and when he heard that the troops were back in Van Rijnsdorp, he ordered the commandos to gather. He sent word to Van Deventer to bring his men to the head of the pass at uh, Nivotsville, where he would wait for him, while another messenger was sent to Bower, bidding him to keep his men below until assistance came. The various smaller local patrols were also ordered in, and General Smuts and his staff made for the appointed rendezvous at the edge of the berg. The arrangements worked perfectly. In three days, Van Deventer arrived with his fighting men and we descended on the mountain to Urien's Kral on the plains where Bower was eagerly waiting for us. This was the first time that our entire original commando had been reunited since parting under the Sierbergen, and there was great cheering and handshaking when we rode up. That night our whole force marched out, intending to attack Van Rensdorp at daybreak. But when it grew light, we found that the English troops had been withdrawn to a place called Vintuk 
about 10 miles back, which was being turned into a fortified camp. So we lay over in the recovered village until dark. General Smuts had decided to attack Vintuk at dawn the next morning, but I missed the fight, for I was not told of what was pending and was sent off at sunset with a message to a post stationed towards Willifons. I arrived after midnight and spent the night with the picket. At dawn I was in the saddle on the return journey, and as I rode towards Van Rijn's door, I heard distant rifle fire and hurried towards it. As I approached, the firing grew heavier for a while and then died down altogether, so that I knew one side had been worsted. Then I came on Commandant van Deventer, huddled on the ground before his horse, badly wounded and in great pain. Blood was pouring from a bullet wound in his throat, and his tongue was so lacerated that he could not speak. Two men with him told me that the fight was over, and that the, the English camp at Vintuk had been captured. I galloped on and met about a hundred disarmed soldiers marching across the felt without their boots. They said our men had ordered them to find their way back to Clan William, and fifty miles away. In a few seconds I reached the scene of action. General Smuts had surrounded the camp at daybreak, and after a sharp fight had overwhelmed it, killing and wounding many, and capturing the rest about 200 in number. He had not come off light either, having lost five men killed and 16 wounded, but he had taken wagons, horses, arms and ammunition, and he had re-established his hold on these parts. As I rode through the camp, I found Nicholas Swart lying on the ground, apparently dead. A bullet had struck him, struck him in the chest and had traversed the length of his body, emerging on his left thigh, showing that he must have been bending forward when he was hit. His face was so pale that I thought him dead, so I went to one of the wagons in search of something to throw over his body. But when I came back, his eyes were open, and he asked me in a whisper for a drink of water, which I gave him from my bottle. We carried him into the shade of a wagon and uh, roughly bandaged his wounds. As we could do nothing further for the moment, I left him in order to look around the rest of the captured convoy, now being ransacked by the men. It was parked around uh, the dwelling house in which the troops had made their last stand. And seeing Wendell of the rake section, I went to tell him about Nicholas. He had, he had shared in the attack, but did not know that Nick had been wounded. And he said we must search the house for pillow slips or sheeting for better bandages. As we went through the rooms, strewn with upturned chairs, etc., in the hand-to-hand -hand, uh, fighting, we, we saw a man in civilian clothing crouched under the arched fireplace in the kitchen. I thought it was the owner of the farm, not yet recovered from his fright. But when I drew Wendell's uh, attention to him, he exclaimed, By God, it's Colleen! I did not know Colleen, but Wendell dragged him from the house, shouting to the men outside to come see who was here and soon dozens of angry men were muttering threats and curses at the wretched spy. He was a man of about 45 in appearance, a typical backfelt boor, with flowing beard and uh, corduroys. He was brave enough now, for when the men fiercely assured him of his certain fate, he shrugged his shoulders and showed no sign of fear. Commandant Bower came up while we were crowding round and ordered two men to guard him 
until General Smuts was notified. Wendell and I found some linen and went back to look for Nicholas, but found him gone and were told that he had been loaded on a mule wagon with other casualties for removal to another farm. As I was well found in horses and equipment since a middle post affair, the present convoy did not much interest me. But I collected some newspapers and books, and uh, leaving the men at their looting, I prepared to ride down to the farm known as Atis, belonging to old Isaac van Seil, the local member of parliament, where General Smuts was said to be. But first I went to see who were killed, and was sad to find among them young Martin Vessels, a school friend who had spent many of his holidays with my brothers and myself in the old Bloemfontein days. I had met him just two days before, for the first time during the war, having come on him with one of the small rebel bands in the neighbourhood. He had been wounded and captured by the British a year ago, but with uh, Cornelius Vermaas, now also dead, he had left the train in the Hex River mountains and uh, rejoined the commandos. When I entered the homestead at Atis, General Smuts was in the dining room talking to the owner, Isaac van Seil, whose wife and daughters were there too. And before long, Colain, the spy, was ushered in by his guards, who wanted to know what to do with the, their prisoner. General Smuts had heard the whole story of Colain's treachery and after questioning the escort to make sure of the man's identity, he sentenced him to death without fur further formality. When the general said to the guards, take him out and shoot him, Colain's nerve failed him and falling to his knees, he begged for mercy while the woman fled from the room in tears. General Smuts repeated his order, but as the condemned man was being led out, the Reverend Creel came in and asked leave to pray for the soul of this poor sinner. So Colain was taken to a little smithy behind the dwelling house, and when I looked in a little later, I saw him and the clergyman kneeling side by side against the plow tail deep in prayer. After a while, Andres de Vet of our staff was told to collect a firing party, and as he disliked the job, he asked me to accompany him. We sent some Hottentot servants to dig a grave out of sight of the house, to spare the feelings of the inmates. And uh, ordering three men who had off-saddled in the garden to fetch their rifles, we went to the workshop door. Catching Mr. Creel's eye, the vet pointed to the prisoner and the clergyman touched the kneeling man on the shoulder and said, Brother, be a man. Your time has come. Colain took the news calmly and uh, he rose from his knees, shook the parson by the hand and bidding goodbye to the guards, said that he was ready. We led him to where the grave was being dug. On the way he spoke to us. He said he knew he deserved to die. But he was a poor man. And had taken blood money to keep his wife and children from starving. The Hottentots were just completing the grave when we came up. And the unfortunate man blanched when he looked into the shallow pit. Perhaps... He had still hoped for a reprieve until he saw it. Even now he tried to gain time by appealing to us to send for Mr. Creel to say a final prayer with him. Then he turned to me and asked me to fetch General Smuts, but we felt that the sooner it was over the better. So the vet blindfolded him and placed him at the head of the grave. 
realizing that this was the end, Kalain held up his hands and in a low tone recited the Lord's Prayer while the firing party silently arranged themselves. As he came to the final Amen, they fired. With a convulsive jerk, he pitched backwards into the grave and the frightened Hottentots quickly covered him with earth. When we returned, we found that the wounded had been brought down from Vintuk and were being placed in the main dwelling house. Nicholas Swart was still alive. In fact, the jolting seemed to have improved his condition, for he was conscious and able to speak. He was put in a room by himself, while the rest were laid on mattresses or on straw, wherever the mistress of the house and her daughters could find a room for them. Nicholas was taken with a, a sick man's fancy that I should remain by his side. When I tried to leave him, he seized my hand and would not let go. So General Smut said I was to stay, and I sat by his side all that afternoon, all through the, the following night. At intervals, I renewed the wad of damp cloth over the wound in his chest, doing this for close on 20 hours, and soon after daybreak, he fell into an easy sleep. And from then onward, he began to slowly mend, and when, within a month was well again. Of the other wounded, only one man died, the rest all making good progress, thanks to the care of the woman and the wonderful climate. The camp at Vintuk had cost us more men than it was worth, but the English were discouraged from further attempts to dislodge us and from the Oliphants northwards, we were left in possession of an area that we were beginning to regard as our peculiar property. So much was this the case that General Smuts once more broke up the commandos and distributed the men in small patrols until he should need them for a fresh effort. This entailed much work for the members of the staff, who were kept riding backwards and forwards from one detachment to another, in order to maintain contact. I, however, stayed behind at the farm, as Nicholas Swart would not hear of my leaving. And while I was here, I had time to read the English newspapers that I had found in the Vintu camp. I gathered from certain letters and articles that there were many people in England who thought that the war was unfair. I cut out one poem and have kept it ever since. It ran, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Man, Christmas Day, 1901. The story is too old, no more it thrills. Pity is dead. Peace is a paltry art. How can a glory on Judean hills make glad my heart? The mighty splendors of our state shall show a worthier creed than Decalogue or love. Let dead and vengeance, launched on every foe, our greatness prove. Why mock us with the thoughts of Bethlehem and glory humbled and exalted grace? Celestial music fits not with our theme, our pride of race. Dear God, forgive. Let our hearts be stone. Christ's natal message shakes me like a reed. Nor pride, nor power, nor country can condone the wild beast's creed. At the end of ten days, Nicholas was much better, and that I was able to get away in search of General Smuts, whom I found on the banks of the Willifons River down towards the, the mouth. The sea lay, lay only 25 miles from here, and the day after my return, he sent word to the units quartered within reach that all who had never seen it were to be sent to him. Some 60 or 70 arrived within the next four, 48 hours, 
and with these we set off for a small inlet on the coast called Fishwater. We rode via the Ebenezer Mission Station and towards the afternoon caught a glint of the sea through a gap in the dunes. It was amazing to watch the expression on the men's faces as the great expanse of ocean burst into their view. For few of them had seen anything bigger than the dam on their parents' farm. And as we topped the last sand hills, they looked in amazement on water that stretched beyond the horizon. With one accord, they reined in their horses in silence and then, like Greek soldiers, rushed forward in a body, crying, The sea! The sea! each wanting to be the first on the beach. Soon they were throwing off their uh, clothes and our trouble was not to get them to enter the waves but to prevent them from venturing too deep. For they were pitching down their, their saddles and riding barebacked into the surf, shouting and laughing whenever a rider and his mount were thrown headlong by the breakers. After a while, General Smuts ordered three of us to ride along the shore towards some huts in the distance to inquire whether any troops had been here of late. In doing so, we had an amusing encounter with a Hottentot fisherman. He stared open-mouthed at the sight of armed boers patrolling the waterline and seeing his surprise, I halted my horse and ordered him in a peremptory tone to show me where the road went through. And he said, What road, boss? Pretending to be angry, I replied, The road to England, you fool! And show me the way at once, for we are crossing tonight to capture London. He looked at me for a moment, and then exclaimed, My God, boss, don't do it. The water is over your head here, yeah, and you will all be drowned. <laughs> when next I met Moritz and told him this story, he said that two of his men had recently ridden onto the beach at Lambert's Bay, where an English cruiser lay at anchor, close in shore, and uh, dismounting, they opened fire. Their bullets pattered harmlessly against the armoured side of the warship, and when the crew turned a gun on them, they made haste to disappear into the sand hills. But on their return to their commando, they boasted that they had fought the only naval action of the war. <laughs> that night, we camped in the dunes, sitting around great fires of driftwood, the men discussing what they had seen until far into the night and telling each other of things that they would have to recount when they got home again. We spent two more days here, boating on the estuary and helping the local fishermen to drag their nets. And then we returned along the Willifants River to our starting place, proud of having our horses into the sea. <laughs>